what's going to happen. This is going to be really fun for everybody. Now here. <laughs> so what you get to do is you just got to go like this. Can you do that? You can do it. This is good. Just don't freak out. You don't want to get bit. It's going to be awesome. You ready? No kidding. Come on. You made a face. If you didn't want me to think you shouldn't have made a face. <laughs> So this thing is full grown. This is as big as he gets. Okay, this guy is awesome. He's super cool. No peeking. You're peeking. Shiny. 
then you see a snake that's shiny, they have smooth scales. And you'll feel the difference when we get some of the smooth scaled snakes out. Really cool. Does anybody have any questions about Porky the Western Hawk? Um, in uh, Jeremiah chapter 10, God says this, But the Lord is the true God. He is the living God and the everlasting King. At His wrath the earth shall tremble, the nations shall not be able to abide His indignation. Thus shall ye say unto them, The gods that have not made the heavens and the earth, even they shall perish from the earth. And from under these heavens, he hath made the earth by his power. He hath established the world by his wisdom and has stretched out the heavens by his discretion. And it goes on. we got to remember, we can trust God's word and we're either going to believe what God says here or we're going to believe what man says. And we're trying to say, look, we can trust what God says. Yeah. Impressive to watch some of these guys eat when you give them a big meal, and then it will see them just work it back in. And then on top of that, they don't have like if you have a meal that big, sometimes it can take them. I mean, one of my snakes it probably take them 45 minutes to eat a big rat. He's he's probably about that thick. It's a boa constrictor. He's a boa constrictor. It takes him like 45 minutes to eat. So how does he not suffocate? If he can't breathe for 45 minutes. Because God thought of everything. He has his, he has a tube he can stick out to the side. Or he can protrude out from his mouth. And he can breathe through that tube. Incredible design. And his mouth can open almost 180 degrees for swallows in there. And you'll see their jaws, they open up, they come apart. And he can work up. And he can breathe while he's working that animal down. Then he can squeeze it down. They have super slow metabolism. He usually eats once every two weeks. And then a lot of times in the winter, a lot of our snakes go into brumation where they don't eat for like three or four months. So when the temperature drops down into like the low, probably 55, 60, they'll brumate. So they'll still drink and they'll still move around a little bit, but they don't eat. And so they'll be sitting there, not eating for a long time. Uh, we have eight right now. Nailed it. This is a ball python. This is a ball python. So these guys are really, really cool. These guys are a constrictor. So these guys bite onto their prey. Their teeth are back into their face like that. So their teeth are kind of curved facing back. So when they grip on, it's pretty hard to get get away from them. They have a pretty good grip. Yeah, because you're thinking, like, if one of these things had a hold of your arm, you're thinking, i got to jerk my arm out. Well, that's just making it hang on more. you got to push your arm in to get it loose from those teeth that aim back, and then you can get it out. Yeah. So it's really hard. When they latch on to you, it can be pretty hard to get them off. There's a few tricks. If you put, like, alcohol in their mouth, they don't like it, and they'll usually spit you out. Or if you put their head under warm slash hot water, they'll usually spit you out. If you try to pull them off like he was saying, it hurts. And you're going to be bleeding a lot. You're probably going to have some broken off teeth stuck in your butt. In. Really, really cool animal. So this is a ball python. They're found in Africa. And they're the smallest species of python in the world. They'll max out, females max out at like six feet. And males are going to be between four and five feet. This is a young male ball python, so he will get bigger, but he won't get too much bigger. Pythons have a really cool organ on their upper lip. Would you like to talk about that? No, you go ahead. I want to hear how you do it. Okay. <laughs> See that? I'm trying to learn from this guy. They have heat pits, so when they come by, or at the end, when you get to look at this guy up close, look at his lip. He has heat pits. There's little holes on that lip. So he can see in infrared. He can see body heat. So these guys, when they're hunting, they can hunt at night, and they can see the body heat of an animal to grab it. Really awesome. But these guys are annoying to feed. Most of them are colubrids, like that little hog nose. You get them a room temperature mouse, they smell it, bam, they're on it, they're good to go. These guys, you have to warm it up. 
They need it to be slightly warmer because a lot of times they'll go for your hand. If they see your hand, they'll spell them out, but they'll go for your hand because it's hot. And so you have to heat those mice up for them to grab them. That's a nice pattern. I would say most like of the time, it. they will strike and they will Where miss it at? if it's not oh, warm. It so they, they, they know doing? it's there, but they'll go, wait, and they'll usually go right to the side of it. And they'll miss it if you don't heat it up. So that those heat bits are incredible. How do you warm up your parts of mice? How do I warm them up? I put them in hot water. When that tongue goes in, they'll flip that fork tongue up into those grooves. And that will send whatever they picked up on their tongue to their brain, and that's how they sense their world. So when they're trying to find their food, they and they put it in that organ, and they'll find their food like that. And then with the pythons, they have those heat bits too. And like the rattlesnakes around here have them also. How was that an accident? Yeah. And other things. Which one? What's that called? That's that video. Um, the, the pythons. Silent, silent hunters. Silent hunters. Yeah. And yeah, they do help with it. infrared. They sense the, by the way, there's a, there's a, a uh, ground squirrel out in Texas that likes to tease these snakes that hunt with infrared because it's heat. And it'll get out there and it'll start wiggling its tail real fast, generates heat. Okay? And the snake will strike at that. And then it'll run over here and jiggle its tail. And it just kind of wears the snake out, just teasing the snake. Uh, but anyway, uh, Dan put this big, it was over 100 pounds, python, on my neck, okay? And he said, now, don't let it go up the tree. We're out here with this tree. Well, it wanted to go up the tree. They'll climb a tree, whereas boas aren't climbers like that, for the most part. Maybe not at all, I don't know. The boas uh, it depends, on, it depends on the species. Yeah, yeah the species. Yeah. So different species of boas, um, sometimes young ones will go up in the tree. Once they get a little bit bigger, they typically will be more terrestrial. But I have a, a boa that's arboreal that we're going to pull out. Okay. Well, the pythons, well, let's say you're, where they grow? In the jungle. And uh, pythons like to eat gibbons. Okay, who knows what a gibbon is? What's a gibbon? It's, a, it's the smallest ape. Okay. They get to be about 35 pounds. And so they like to eat gibbons. And they'll, they'll, the pythons will see where the gibbons go to get lunch and dinner. And they're like follow a trail up in the vines and stuff. So they'll climb up the tree, the python, and wait for a gibbon. All right, here comes a gibbon. And the python has configured itself. So when a gibbon gets here, it can grab it. But God made the gibbon with a 375 degree shoulder joint. So here comes the gibbon, and there's the python. And he grabbed them. Gibbon has a hold of the vine, and he sees the python, and he's, uh oh, that python wants to eat me. So he doesn't let go. He just turns, he's going to go the other way. But the python knows he can do that. See, they're really smart. And the python has configured itself, so if he does turn around, the python's whoop, right there on him. So he starts to turn, and the, he sees, uh oh, the python is coming this way. And he just keeps going right on around, never let go, and keeps going the direction he's going. And that's how he gets away. It's the only uh, primate that has a 370 degree shoulder joint. And that's to get away from the pipe. I mean, from the who's, who's, who, who's what? It's the gibbon that has the shoulder, all right? But the pythons have to eat too, so they catch one every now and then. But yeah, it's fascinating. All these different things got built into these animals had his particular python with him. And he kind of wrapped it over his shoulder and wrapped it around, but it's, it's cold. So it was kind of warm. He gets in there and he's talking about, now he's in this church building and it starts warming up, it's warming up, warming up. All of a sudden that python, who hadn't eaten in a while, it's warmed up. And it starts constricting on Dan. And a matter of fact, Dan got to the point where he said, Will you tell me you men come up here, please? It took two men to unwind that python from around Dan. Yeah, once it warmed up, he says, I'm going to eat. Yeah. It was, anyway, he's like, the ones we were working with, the uh, python, when you squeeze it, they're both constrictors. You squeeze the python, it's soft, okay? You squeeze the big boa, and it's as hard as a rock. Now they're both constrictors. So what did God do there? I've never been able to find out why. Why does one have soft muscles, the other one has hard muscles? But there's a difference in this. The pythons, I'm 
there, there, there. Lay the eggs. And the boas give birth to live babies. So maybe it's because of protecting the eggs or protecting the live babies for some reason. We have a difference. And we have a friend that raises chickens <coughs> to sell to zoos and people want for pets. And they have this female python that absolutely, she loved this, this guy. And she would actually come over, when she saw him coming, come over to say hello. And then he would give, they fed him live rabbits and stuff. But anyway, one day he comes out, she wouldn't come over. She had some eggs. She wouldn't come over. She wrapped herself around her eggs. So he had offended her somehow. He never figured it out. What, what he did, she never would come back over again. She went to his wife, but not to him. So he insulted the snake somehow. So you're thinking, do they think like that? Well, he said he thought they did. Well, have you had experiences? Yeah, I guess I'm kind of on the other side. I feel like they don't have nearly as much emotion as others. Like they can't, they tend to not like bond to you as much as other animals. Like a lot of the lizards, they like will know you. Yeah. And they will bond a lot more. The snakes, typically, I would lean on the side that they don't, they don't bond. But another thing, tell me how this happens. This can't evolve if God didn't put it in place from the very start. We would not have pythons. Pythons lay eggs. And if you take a python egg and you rotate it like the slightest bit, it dies. And pythons, a lot of species, will sit on their eggs to defend them so stuff doesn't get them. So their eggs stick together. So they lay their eggs and they all stick together. So that way while they're crawling around on, they don't accidentally flip one over. Because the second you flip it over, that egg dies, and a snake crawling around, a 20-foot bow or a python crawling around our eggs will flip every egg within like minutes. So how does that evolve? It doesn't. It is something that God put in place from the very beginning, that these eggs stick together so they can sit on top and defend their eggs and protect their young until they hatch. And now they even build a little pile of their eggs, they kind of just pile them up. And then if it's really chilly, they'll wrap around it and flex their muscles to generate heat. How do they know to do that? Yeah. <laughs> All right. So does anybody know what's going on right here? <laughs> Albino, any other guesses? Molting. Python? This is a python. This is the exact same species of python that we just looked at. This is a ball python. It's molting, so it's shedding its skin. Any other ideas? Leucistic. So this is a leucistic mutation. This is a genetic mutation. It's called piebald. So if you have a leucistic, a leucistic is going to be solid white. The piebalds are half pattern, half white. The cool thing about a piebald is it affects different amounts of the body. So every piebald you see is going to be a different looking animal. It can affect 90% of their body. So they can just have like a colored head and then a white body. Or they can just have like a tiny white spot on them. So they're all different. <coughs> they're really, really cool. And this does occur in the wild. Around here you see turkey. I've probably seen over a dozen piebald turkey and probably about seven piebald deer. So you'll see a deer running around, white-tailed deer, and they're half white. We're going to bring this guy around to look. So this is a genetic mutation. This happens in the wild. And there's one spot in Africa where there's like a huge population of piebald ball pythons. And it ruins their camouflage. So these guys are going to have a harder time surviving in the wild than just a normal. A lot of people think that he's albino, but an albino animal it affects the entire animal. Whereas this just affects part of the color. If it's albino, it affects 100% of the animal, and it only affects the melanin. So depending on how dark skin you are, it's how much melanin you have. And these guys have other things that cause color. Like the parrots have different things that cause color. These guys have carotenoids in their skin, which are yellow. So when one of these guys is albino, they are yellow and white. Is the texture different from the colors? A little, it, it seems to be a little bit. Yeah, because it looks different. Like yeah. Like it's smooth or rough or, or... Yeah, so a lot of times the, the like melanin 
in birds at least, and it, I, I don't know if it is in snakes, so don't quote me, but in birds it's a structural component to their feather. So when you have an albino bird, their feathers wear out quicker because they don't have that added melanin to add structure to their feather. And if you feel him, it does feel different. Yeah. The white is softer than the color. Oh, wow. So, is he smelling now? I know I can do anything, but I'm just going to show off just a little bit. So this is a Brazilian rainbow boa. I love rainbow And they are... So, if What's you can see them. What's the difference from a rainbow boa and the rainbow boa? Do they have the same personality? Uh, no, they do not. I don't know if you can see that. Do you see that iridescence on the skin? So, these guys, if you get them out in the daylight, they look like an oil spill. And it is absolutely ridiculous. In wow. indoor lighting, it's a little bit harder to see. You can kind of see it there, though. But when you get them in the daylight, this is the most ridiculous looking snake you have ever seen. We have this combination, still a snake, but it's got all these different characteristics or different colors. Right? He had that all figured out before there was anything. How? There's no way to even comprehend the genius of the God of the Bible. There's no way. Okay. We're just saying, wow. Lord Jesus, you are something else. I tell you what. And then you think that he loves us. I mean, he loves us. Uh, I, and then God wants us to call him our Father, which are in heaven. Okay? So, yeah. By the way, um, you all have a good resource. Mike, I'm listening to it. I think he's about the best there is with a young man his age. Okay? So, Consistent prayer. Yes. Because he's got a target on his back. Right. Okay. The devil wants to destroy him. He does David Reeves back there. Young guys coming along. Okay. And the devil wants to destroy him. So you they come to mind. Michael, David, you pray for him. Well, there's a there's this one looks exactly almost exactly like a Chuck Wall loser. And then and of course they Yeah. This is this is very similar to a chuckwalla, yeah. and he's going to talk about the gland that these guys have. They have very similar habits, but this is called a uromastix, and this is a yellow Nigerian uromastix, and her name is Brenda, and she is a female. So the males will be like yellow, super duper yellow. Can you say, here Brenda, here Brenda, and she comes running? <laughs> All right, would you mind talking about that tail? Or the, the nose? Yeah. yeah, so they, uh, they, they eat, they're, they're in the desert, and they eat things that have a high salt content, but they don't drink much water, all right? Matter of fact, some of them don't drink any water. They get the moisture they get either from what they eat or from sometimes there's a dew in the morning, and the dew will soak in to their body. But these, once they got all this salt, they got to get rid of it. So our Lord put these... Uh, desalination factories in their nose. So every now and then, they sneeze. And they sneeze pure salt crystals. So, you need a little extra salt on the table, get it <laughs> There it is. Okay. Pure, pure salt crystals out their nose. Very similar to the Chuck Walla. These guys, they have this really spiny tail. So the defense mechanism that God gave them is they will run into Rocks. They get up into a crack and then they inflate themselves. Yeah, sure. And they pop up and then it's literally impossible. My wife and I were out west catching Chuck Wallace, and once they get into a rock, you cannot get them out. They pop up and then when you go into the crack after them, they'll take that tail and they'll whack you with it. Really cool. <laughs> really cool little lizard. And these guys, there's a lot of different species of Euromastics, and they get like the Egyptian Euromastics gets like two and a half feet long or something. Like they get big. But this is 
a full-grown little Nigerian Euromastix. Where did the from? Nigeria? Yeah, they're from Africa, but they're kind of like... to his mouth. Alright? So what, what did God say everything ate up until the flood of Noah? Plants. Genesis 1, 29 and 30. Everything is eating plants including T-Rex. So some researchers at least some species of T-Rex the crown of their tooth, the white part, is up to 8 inches long but the root is only like about an inch. So they say he probably used those teeth to strip leaves off of trees. Because if he fit it into a giant squirming lizard, he'd probably just tip his teeth right out. He'd have to come and see me tomorrow for some false teeth. <laughs> and uh, so, keep that in mind. Because a lot of current literature has T-Rex eating these big lizards. He may be a roadkill, but he couldn't grab it and hold it like this. No way. One other really cool design feature on this species of lizard is their ear hole. 
So one of the differences between snakes and lizards is snakes do not have external ear openings. So if you see a snake that has a hole in its head, it's either a lizard or it's dead. <laughs> there are legless lizards. So there's quite a few different species of legless lizard, but they will have eyelids, they can blink. A snake doesn't have eyelids. They have a special scale over their eye called a spectacle. And that protects their eye. And then if it does get a scratch on it, it'll shed off whenever they shed. And then these guys, they have eyelids, so they can blink, but they're ear holes. They're open. These guys spend a lot of time underground. So you, they don't want to get dirt and stuff in their ears. So you've got to give them the ability to shut that ear. They can close it off when they go underground. That way it keeps dirt and all that debris out of their ear. So when you guys get up close, we're about to break it. We'll put some animals out around the room so you can go touch it and interact with them. Look at their ear hole. It's really cool. It's really cool. Also, as you're going around, the evolutionists say that birds evolved from reptiles or dinosaurs. Look at a scale. It's like a fold in the skin. That's it. It's not like a hair. It doesn't grow out of a follicle. Feathers grow out of follicles. And they molt like once a year. These guys shed when they outgrow their skin. So if you get a box from Amazon, and you open it up, and inside that box is a bigger box, that's why these guys shed. Because they kind of outgrow that outer layer of that keratin, and they shed it off. The lizards will shed in pieces. A healthy snake will shed in one piece. So they'll catch it, and it'll just they'll crawl out of their skin. It'll invert it, so it'll be like you pull your sock off, just like that. That's how they get out of their skin, and they replace it. Depending on the species and how fast they're growing, young snakes will shed pretty often because they're growing a lot more. But really cool. Look at their scales. There's no way that that branched off and turned into a feather. They say like an elongated scale, which on one of our other lizards, hmm. he's going to be out to pet. I'm not going to talk about him. Um, look at those elongated scales. They are just that scale. There's no follicle. If that frayed, it's not going to do any good for them. You cannot get a feather out of a scale. And not only can you not get a feather out of a scale, even if you've got a feather out of a scale, you can't get the hollow bones. You can't get all this stuff in tiny sections. You can't get the lung of a bird. You can't get the shoulder joint of a bird. You can't get the furricular, that fused collarbone of a bird. They don't have all those things. First time they flap their wing, if they don't have that furricular, that wishbone, they would break their clavicles because those muscles are so strong. If they don't have all that stuff in place, Feathers don't do them any good. These guys have the slowest metabolism on the planet. You could probably not feed that lizard for a year. Like reptiles have the slowest metabolism. Birds have the fastest. Wow. They are so different. There's no you way you might they can get one from the other. Plus, a lot of textbooks that say one of the evidence is that the birds came from the reptiles is the birds have scales on their legs and feet. Wonderful. Well, the trouble is those aren't scales. Okay. Uh, scales, their source is on the external surface, the ectoderm. And it just goes on. Whereas what is on birds' legs, they're called scoops or scutes. And the, the origin of those is deep down in the skin. Totally, two totally different things. Okay? But the textbooks will still tell you. Well, take a look at that bird's feet. Those are scales, just like reptiles. No, nope, they're not scales, okay? So many times, what the textbook tells us isn't true. We just have to have some discernment, yeah. yeah. And so God created the animals after their kind. And Darwin has a quote, I was gonna pull it out, but we're running out of time. That talks about why, why do you see everything in this nice, orderly fashion? If evolution were true, it seems like it would be chaos. You'd see everything just like, Wishwash, but everything's well defined. And that's because God created the animals after his kind. He says after his kind, and then when he gets to mankind, bring that little monkey up, <laughs> he created man in his image. In the image of God, he created them. So this is my last prop. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to stick him in a bucket too. But... <laughs> now, how old is he? Yesterday? Yesterday? Mama's out here. Yep, this is my boy Spires. He's pretty awesome. <laughs> so, in the image of God, he 
created he created the animals and they're incredible. He thought of everything. And then he goes and he's like, oh, I'm going to create you in my image. That should give you so much value when you look at an animal and see how perfect he designed it. And then to think of yourself being designed in his image. That's incredible. Like a little baby like this doesn't just happen. Their skulls shift around. You should have seen this thing when it was born. It was the <laughs> ugliest thing. <laughs> Biggest cone shaped head of the night. He goes in a trap game. You know. <laughs> I'm sorry, I hurt his feelings. <laughs> 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 no wonder that didn't become that baby. At the point of conception. Yeah. That's everything that he is genetically was there at that point. So now I'm. My birthday is April 30th. I'll be 83. But I was conceived on the last week of July, 1939. So now when people ask me, how old are you, old man? I'll say, I was conceived on the last week of July, 1939. Now, why am I doing it? Because there's a whole generation of young people out there don't think that is anything. It's just a piece of tissue. And you can get rid of it. It's no problem. No, it's everything that you are, you were, on that day, the day of conception. So in Matthew it says, Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground outside your father's care. Even the very hairs on your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid you are worth more than many sparrows. Or more than many sparrows. Right. The, he didn't say like the hairs are numbered. He, or he said they're numbered, so he knows which ones fall out. Yeah, he did. He not did. how many are on the <laughs> <laughs> He knows which ones fall out. Which numbers? That's incredible. God really thought of everything. Really thought about everything. Um, so we're gonna have some interaction with the animals now. So I'm gonna have our exponential team is gonna bring animals 